Mafu's talker has no idea what the heck he's talking about regarding hypersonic missiles. Now, this guy calls himself a geopolitics news analyst and unbiased without Western spin. Uh, if you look at his stuff, it's all pro-Russia, pro-China, anti-West, anti-Semitic ranting, which is funny because it's done from the safety of London. Uh, it is kind of weird how like a lot of these anti-West content creators who hate the West live in Western democracies and work for Western companies. In this guy's case, it looks like he works as a cybersecurity guy for Close Brothers in London. Uh, I mean, the dude fell for the whole greater Israel thing, which is something I debunked over a year ago and kind of keeps dr driving on like this anti-Semitic Frankenstein's monster. And actually, that was my first clue uh, that this guy has no idea what he's talking about. Uh, because uh, even if you have just a little bit of, of military knowledge, you know that Israel does not have an expeditionary army with the mass fires and logistics to actually invade and occupy a landmass of that size. They can't even occupy Gaza and it's the size of Detroit. We couldn't even occupy Detroit, not even with the help of Robocop and Ed 209. War is hard. So whenever I see someone pushing this map, I kind of know that they don't have the first clue about how the military actually works. Oh, and also he apparently thinks Iran won the 12-day war. Right. <laughs> Boy, man, if that's the case, Iran can't afford many victories like that. Now, uh, normally someone with such a small viewer count, uh, I would just ignore this dude. But one of my viewers told me about it, and he said this particular video was getting really popular. And it was about the uh, Russian Arashnik hypersonic missile. And I watched the video, and there were so many mistakes in it, I thought I was watching a Johnny Harris video. So let's go over the video. And uh, I'll, if you want to watch this dude's content, I'll put a link below if you really want to watch it because it is his content. Okay, let's get started. A missile that travels at hypersonic speeds, over 10 times the speed of sound itself, 12,000 kilometers an hour as the crow flies with a nightmarish ability of being able to bob and weave. Oh no, oh no. Now this is not new. Uh, missiles have been hypersonic since the German V2 back in the 1940s. But whenever a ballistic missile actually re-enters the atmosphere, it's hypersonic. It is going at least five times the speed of sound. And this is nothing new. Now, hypersonic glide vehicles can be a different story, but the Russian Oreshnik missile is a ballistic missile with a little bit of maneuvering capability um, in a certain phase of flight, and I'll get to that. Um, but we, we kind of know down to a certain condition how this thing works, and that I will get to. Is, is able to weave, maneuver, to avoid interception, even at extreme speeds, and still hit its target. So it can do that to an extent, or at least in a pre-programmed maneuver. The warhead for the missile can't really intelligently avoid interception, because remember, it's going Mach 10. At that speed, upon re-entry, there is a cone plasma around the missile. Remember that movie Apollo 13, when there was a radio blackout for like two, three minutes? while the capsule is re-entering the atmosphere, that's because you can't trans transmit radio signals past that cone of plasma. So that means the missile warhead has no way of detecting whether it's been targeted by an interceptor because it can't use radar, can't use thermals, it can't use cameras, it can't see past the re-entry plasma. So essentially it's blind to anything coming up into the atmosphere at high speed. Now it can maneuver on a pre-programmed or random path but think of it like a soccer player running the ball down the field blindfolded. Even blindfolded, the soccer player can still make random movements, which might make it harder for the defensive midfielder to intercept them, right? But the defensive midfielder can still see, and they can still make corrections. And, you know, while we're at it here, we all know where the player is headed. The player is headed toward the goal. That's not a mystery. So what's the goal for the arrestic missile? Well, it's going to be the most high value target in your theater of operations, right? You're not going to use it to blow up a dude that, that's scrolling TikTok leaning up against the wall, right? You're going to use it for a high value target. Where do you put your interceptors? At the high value target. <laughs> so that's actually pretty darn important because it's easier to intercept when you are the target. At some point, the missile has to stop its maneuvering 
because it's going really, really fast. I want you to imagine you're going to drive in a car and your job is to lean out the door and pick up a penny that's on the side of the road. Is it easier to do that when you're going really fast or really slow? Probably really slow. Now imagine trying to do that while you're bobbing and weaving, right? At some point, you're going to have to straighten out that car when you're on terminal approach to that penny. You need to straighten out that car, even if you're going to try to pick it up going fast. So once you start to get on that terminal path and you're going straight at the target, that's when you're vulnerable. Let's keep going got multiple warheads at the front of it in a bunch similar to how hazelnuts grow. So this isn't new either. They're called MIRVs or Multiple Independently Targetable Reentry Vehicles. This tech has been around since the 1960s. This is nothing new. America has them, France has them, the UK has them. They're sort of like collected together. These are MIRVs or MIRVs, uh, Multiple independently routable vehicles or something I, I actually forgot I well if you're going to call yourself an analyst you might want to remember the things you're analyzing there bub uh you know this kind of reminds me of that scene in the 1987 movie throw mama from the train when billy crystal is teaching uh, creative writing and this one woman writes a submarine war story but has no idea how submarines work dive yelled the captain through the thing so the man who makes a dive pressed a button or something and it dove and the enemy was foiled again. Incidentally, this is why I'm really good at my job finding bad guys to drop bombs on because I can remember a line from a movie that I saw once 38 years ago. To use a quote from another movie, why do terrorists even think they have a chance against me? Do you know who I am? Have you any idea how many anonymous henchmen I've killed over the years? And look at you, you haven't even got a name tag. You've got no chance. Why don't you just fall down? But to his credit, he does remember it later. The multiple independent reentry vehicles. It means at the end of these missiles flights, these warheads can each fly off and hit to different targets. So this isn't just wrong, it's dead wrong. The missile doesn't release its warheads at the end of flight or in the terminal phase, it releases them in the post-boost phase. There's four phases to a ballistic missile launch. Boost, post-boost, mid-course, and this is where you might start doing your corrections, and terminal. If the weapon is doing any kind of corrections, it's going to be in the mid-course phase, or maybe between the mid-course and terminal phase, because once you get on that terminal phase, you are committed. You can't really do any corrections because you're coming down so fast you don't have a lot of time. If you even believe this guy up to that point, a simple Google search would show you that this person did not research the topic. America has hypersonics. I believe France has hypersonics. But Russia has battle-tested very recently hypersonic missiles. Now, the U.S. does have hypersonic vehicles, and of course our ballistic missiles are hypersonic. One thing to know about hypersonic weapons is that you need to machine alloys that have to withstand maneuvering at hypersonic speeds. And it doesn't matter what country you are, whether you're Russia, China, United States, whatever, you can't cheat physics. Purchasing and machining these alloys is going to be extremely expensive. And that's actually why I'm not too concerned about this specific Arashnik weapons platform, but I'm going to get to that. Let's keep going. It's not some overpriced ordinance sitting in a U.S. strategic reserve somewhere in the Midwest, God knows where, underground, blah, blah, blah. It's in use, the Oreshnik. It has been deployed in the conflict in Eastern Europe against Ukraine. Well, we actually know where all of our land-based nuclear missiles are. I mean, you can bring them up on Google, but I guess he's being hyperbolic. And I, I wouldn't call um, the Ereshnik in use because it was used exactly once in a test. And it wasn't much more of a test. Let's keep going. Okay. Picture this, a missile is traveling at Mach 10, that's 10 times the speed of sound, faster than anything most air defenses can handle already. We're talking about speeds 12,000 kilometers an hour. I'm just saying the numbers again. So that actually isn't true at all, but it depends on the location of the interceptor. If a missile is traveling directly at that target, it's a lot easier to intercept than let's say if it's traveling at the oblique. That's a lot harder to do. You can kind of think about it this way. In baseball, the average fastball speed is 93, 94 miles per hour. And yeah, 
the catcher always seems to be able to catch those fastballs with ease, right? But if you're on first base, you're probably not going to be able to catch that fastball, right? You're not, not going to be able to get there in time. So if you are the target, or if the interceptor is located fairly close to the target, you stand a much better chance of intercepting that missile than you do if the interceptor is based someplace else, right? Where are you going to fire the arresting missile? You're going to fire it at the high value target, right? So that's where you're going to put your air defense. Now, then he talks about uh, the, how the first and only use of the weapon was back in Ukraine, November 2024. And I, I want to kind of point something out here. Military analysts across the world later said there's a good chance Russia dialed the missile capabilities back. That's right. You heard me clearly. They neutered their own missiles when they first deployed them. Because so this is wrong on so many levels, but let me give it a shot. He said that Russia dialed the missile back, and I think that's because this guy doesn't have any military experience. He just doesn't have the tools in his toolkit to really explain what's going on. Luckily, I do. This particular weapon is designed for nuclear warheads. That is the only sensible munition to put on, a, on an intermediate range ballistic missile. That's because intermediate range ballistic missiles are so expensive. We're not talking about battlefield weapons like the Scud. We're talking about intermediate range ballistic missiles. They are hella expensive. Now, odds are what was actually used as the warhead in the weapon was some sort of ballast, maybe concrete or some kind of equivalent material to simulate the mass. And it wanted to show the West, look at what we can do. And we haven't even turned it on, not really. Well, this was a warning, but not like that. It was a way to create nuclear terror and drive a wedge among the coalition in Europe. Russia has the resource, logistics, and sources of tech and materials independent of Western supply chains. Wow, that is way wrong, and I can prove it with a pencil. Actually, let me show you a clip from a video I did about the F-35 and how that relates to pencils. What parts does a pencil have? Well, it has five. The graphite is from Brazil, the wood is from Sweden, the paint is from Estonia, the rubber is from Malaysia, and the metal is from Mozambique. You might be able to manufacture some components like sheet metal independently, but for the most part, you're gonna have to go to another country like China to get the higher end tech items like computer chips. And also, you gotta think about the game Axis and Allies. If you've ever played that board game, you know you have a finite number of IPCs. You can use them to buy infantry, you can use them to buy tanks, you can use them to buy bombers, but there's always a finite supply of money. Now, Russia, of course, does not release the cost of an arresting missile, but you can kind of estimate the cost just by kind of looking at the basics of the components and the raw materials. So, intermediate range ballistic missile might weigh between 20 and 25 tons. Uh, so you need at least that much in aerospace grade steel and composites, right? Uh, so maybe one to two million dollars in structural materials. Uh, for ballistic missiles, most of the missiles actually fuel. So we're talking maybe 15 to 18 tons of fuel. So 300,000 to 600,000 worth of propellant. Engines, five to 10 million each, roughly. Avionics, one to two million. Payload, I don't know how to estimate the payload here, but it's not gonna be zero, right? So even putting, even if you're using concrete ballast, you still have to mate that ballast to the missile. So you have to develop procedures for actually bringing out the crane and lowering the ballast onto the missile because you're going to do it safely, right? You have to make sure that thing doesn't break apart in mid-flight. So there's all this testing you have to do on the ballast. So it, the cost won't be zero. But I honestly don't know how to calculate that number. You put a nuclear warhead on it, it's going to be a lot more expensive. Um, so then there's production overhead. Uh, and I mean, you have to pay for the building where you're assembling the missile. You have to keep the heat on in that building. You have to pay the cafeteria workers who are working in that building. And again, that's one of those things that would, it would, I could probably calculate it, but it would probably take me days to do. It's kind of beyond the scope of the video, but it, it can be done. So I think at the minimum, we're maybe looking at 15 million a pop. Could be double that if they're using genuine Honest God warheads. So let's say we just go with a 15 million number. You know, the most effective weapon on the battlefield right now is not the arresting missile. 
it's it's drones that cost about as much as a PlayStation 5. So for the price of one Arashnik missile, Russia can get 22,761 DJI Mini 3 Series drones. What's going to be more effective on the battlefield? An Arashnik missile or 22,000 drones? So just remember, you only have a limited number of IPCs. And you're not just limited on money, you're limited on machine tools. If you have a company that's machining parts for the Arushnik missile, it means they're not machining replacement parts for, for tanks or for um, the machinery that extracts oil from the ground so you can sell that oil to India and China and, have, and get hard currency, right? You only have a finite amount of industrial capacity. There's a reason why Russia is buying its artillery shells from North Korea. Now, what you, I think what you really have with this particular missile is a prototype that's never going to make it into production, kind of like the T-14 Armada. Russia might make a few of these Arashnik missiles, but they're going to be way too expensive to actually use. It's important. It's not just the West with cutting-edge technology in the defense sector anymore. So the question to military tech isn't how advanced your tech is, but whether you can actually manufacture it and then scale it. Um, why, the key to American power isn't the F-35, it's that we can manufacture 2,000 of them. Uh, it's rare to see Russian soldiers with optics for their rifles, but every American soldier has had an optic on their rifle since the early 2000s. So have the Canadians. So have the Brits. I think the Brits had them in the 80s with their uh, SA-80. Question is, can you produce these weapon systems at scale? I think the, the answer for Russia is they cannot produce the Arushnik at scale. They can build a couple of them, maybe. And that's kind of what this, this person doesn't seem to understand here. They fired one missile a year ago in a test using ballast. And we haven't seen that platform since. Can't say I'm too scared of this thing. The global south is rising up to contest the unipolar, America-led, Western-led world order. I kind of like how you're saying this from the safety of London there, bub. Um, you wonder why you're there. Uh, maybe this Western or American-led world is pretty nice to you. The problem with people like this is that they, they kind of prey on the average person's ability to think critically about weapon systems. Um, and a lot of that stems from the fact that a lot of people, they didn't serve in the Army or they don't have a, an education in science, technology, engineering, and math or STEM. So they might not necessarily know that when a missile re-enters the atmosphere, a cone of plasma develops around the missile, which makes it difficult for the missile to detect that it's being intercepted. All they know is, OMG, hypersonic! And it's because of dudes like this who, let's face it, either don't know what they're talking about or are lying. The best advice I can give you here is that if someone isn't bringing receipts or they're not doing the math in front of you like I did, they probably don't know what they're talking about. And you probably shouldn't listen to them. Hey, if you want to support the channel, grab my Intel Life t-shirt from BunkerBranding.com. You can also grab one of my novels, like The Last Republic. It's a novel that imagines Brigham Young founded his own country instead of the territory of Utah. And what happens 170 years later when the U.S. doesn't want that country around anymore? And uh, you can find that on Audible. Uh, if you're a Marine or on Amazon.com for Kindle or in paperback, thank you so much for watching. It's me, Captain Bannon of the documentary Team Yankee. When I'm not kicking commie butts, I'm wearing t-shirts from Ryan Macbeth available at Bunker Branding, Knife Hands, High Mars, Landmines, Patriot, and even my favorite, the Tow Missile. Mushna, we want t-shirt too. Take a hike, commie. So come on down to Bunker Branding and take a stand for what's really important about America, capitalism.